And this month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Super Inframan, Allison Cook, and Eric Hervin. Thank you all so very much for your incredible support. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight I am talking to Lee Adams. Hey, Lee. Hi. Thanks for having me on. And uh, you have a book on lucid dreaming that's excellent, and it's called what? Uh, it's called A Visionary Guide to Lucid Dreaming. I realize I read this book and never actually looked at the title. <laughs> That's okay. I don't think uh, titles are, you know, the most important aspect of a book. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, like when, you, when you're when you writing a book and we're working with a publisher, sometimes things change. And the title actually is one of those things they changed up because it was going to be called uh, Hidden Gateways. And oh. um, the reason I titled that is because of um, many of the dreams I've had associated with a gateway that I was going through, you know, right. like a lot of people experience tunnels and stuff like that. And, um, so my publisher didn't really think that would make a lot of sense to people. <laughs> so they, so they kind of threw in a lucid dreaming in there, which I'm happy that they did. So people actually understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing you want an interesting title, but at the same time you want the title to explain what the book is, is <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that's not an easy thing to, to accomplish sometimes. No, no, it's not. So how long did it take you to write this? Um, well, it was an ongoing project for uh, a couple of years. Um, most of, you know, like I, I blog as well. So I write about my experiences and what I'm learning and stuff like that on my website. So a lot of the content from the book actually kind of was generated through articles that I've read or wrote and explored myself, you know, and then started taking it apart and assembling it in some type of way that people could actually like read a complete book and get the things that I've been exploring myself and working with throughout the year. So um, if you ask, you know, when, how long did it take you to write a book? I'd say, you know, it took me from being, um, you know, probably in, uh, elementary school when I first was interested in writing a book <laughs> and having, you know, these strange and odd dreams to the point where I finally um, got enough skill and uh, knowledge about some the subjects I was interested in to be able to put it down on some type of paper or so, um, or electronic, you know, yeah. typing. So, yeah, it took a, you know, a lifetime pretty much to, to write this. Um, I think anybody that's an author, you know, probably would say similar or the same thing. It's like, it doesn't just happen. Right. It's kind of happens to you in a way, you know? Now, um, it's not just lucid dreaming you're talking about. That's the main thing. But you talk about other other aspects of dreaming. And uh, it's also sort of a workbook for people who want to get into lucid dreaming. Yeah. Um, well, the book... I, I kind of define lucid dreaming in a different way than most people do. I include like um, out of body experiences and that astral projection into lucid dreaming. I um, hypnogogia, um, sleep paralysis, all those things into lucid dreaming because, in a way, they are part of uh, dreaming and you are aware in those experiences, at least uh, the majority of them. So they can contain some type of lucidity, which is just essentially awareness inside of a dream experience. So I include all those inside that book, uh, as well as, um, you know, most, most book lucid dream books that I read, they kind of spend a lot of time on themselves and trying to explain why they have these experiences, kind of like trying to prove themselves to the, the reader, I think. Mm -hmm. And which is, you know, there's a point to that. Um, I pretty much do that in the first introduction so not even a chapter of my book is like hey this is my kind of my background take it as you will and now we're going to get into it and so the, the majority of the book is actually about what to do after you have lucid dreams um 
And I spend a good portion of the time on that and trying to build like a, a way that people can work with the dream experiences to improve their lives or improve some aspect of their lives or even go deeper into the dream, which, you know, I, I'm open. I leave it open to the dreamer to determine how deep they can go, not limited to my experiences. And so I share some of my personal experiences in the book as well so that people can kind of relate to that and then also see where I kind of expanded into and dove deeper into those dreams so that they can do the same thing. So I like to think of the book as like a way, like a guidebook to um, create your own personal mythology behind the dream and relate it to your own personal life so that you can um, build a relationship with them and um, really kind of learn what they're trying to speak to you versus like um, just generally have the experience and then not do anything with it. You know, it's like a, a lot of people want to have their first lucid dream and then they want to like fly or do something else, you know, and mm-hmm. then after they have those experiences, they're like, okay, you know, like what's next? What's, what's the point of this? You know? So um, that's kind of where I, wanted to make sure to expand on is like what to do after you actually have the experiences, not just how to have the experiences. Right. And, uh, what, where, like, how did you get into lucid dreaming initially? What was your first experience? Um, well, I mean, I've kind of always been able to lucid dream and a good portion of people actually have had lucid dreams. If you really talk to them about it, they kind of, they're like, Oh yeah, I, I kind of was aware that I was dreaming at some point, you know, in one of my dreams. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, it's actually pretty, uh, statistically high rate of people that have had a lucid dream. Um, you know, generally it's around 25%, but, um, I, I think it can be bumped up depending on the questions that those people are asked. So yeah. for me, I've, I would say I've always been able to lucid dream and I can't really recall the first time that I was in a dream and um, realized, you know, like this is a dream. Um, but I, I do have very profound memories of some of my earlier lucid dreams. But um, when things really started taking off, it was later in life when I um, had like a, an out of body experience. And that's when things kind of, um, where I really took notice of this, these experiences and was wondering like, what is going on here? And, um, that was later in life and that profoundly changed me to kind of be on a journey, um, to try to understand these experiences and to, um, try to dive deeper into them. Um, because anybody that's had, you know, anybody that's had a lucid dream is profoundly surprised by the experience itself. But when you have this, like, um, these other experiences that you have through lucidity can be um, almost, you know, spiritual in a way. It can be religious, you know. It can mm-hmm. really shake your your foundation of reality out, and regardless of where you are in life, you know, and um, kind of change your direction. So, yeah. I uh, just the other day had a not a lucid dream that I was lucid dreaming. <laughs> And that was a first. Like I woke up and I said, "Did I just have a dream that I was lucid dreaming?" That's weird. <laughs> yeah, that's an actually an interesting uh, discussion because a lot of people um, there's debate about lucidity and lucid dreams and the ability to actually have a lucid dream because it's um, it's kind of complex to say, but like the the brain is complex enough and uh, powerful enough that. Um, You know, there's always a dream experience that you're having. So, like, when you go into a dream, the world's kind of generated around you already. You know, there's there's a narrative that you already embody in the dream. So you're like, okay, say say I'm like riding a bike, you know, in this like bizarre world or whatever. In the dream character that I am, you know, I I I think that everything's normal. Like I'm that person riding this bicycle going through this like alien world or whatever and everything's fine you know until i wake up and i go what was that you know like that was bizarre so you know in a lucid dream uh people wake up and they you know in the dream they're like wow i'm 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 dreaming you know but uh that the idea that you're 
bec- that you're able to come aware, the memory of like the ability to become lucid, the the dream narrative that is you're experiencing and in a lucid dream, there's always like a narrator generating the content and the memories and the active experience that you're having prior to you really consciously experiencing it. So in that sense, it's always kind of a debate if like people aren't actually just dreaming that they're lucid, like you were just saying yeah. in your dream, or they're actually aware that they're dreaming. Um, there's like the Tibetan Buddhist um, dream yoga, they, the tr- Tibetan dream yoga um, uh, community, they would also debate this and they would say that there's no such thing as like a real uh, lucid dream until you have like a, what they call a, a white dream. So it's like a um, the dream without a dream. It's beyond the actual generation of the the dream content, and that's when you're actually finally aware. So um, to me, it's still up in the air. You know, I I've had the same thing where um, you know I'm I lose a dream, and then um, I have an experience in the dream where um, maybe I lose awareness, or I wake up in the dream, and then I'm you know still. Uh, forget that I, I was lucid in a dream. So it's like a dream inside a dream. And then I become aware of that dream. You know, it gets really complicated and <laughs> <laughs> it can be very confusing. It's kind of synonymous to waking reality too, I think, you know? Yeah. Well, I've had pl- plenty of lucid dreams. So like when I woke up, I'm like, I wasn't lucid, but I was dreaming. I was lucid. That's, that's, that's unique to me. I've not had that one before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had interesting ones uh, recently where I'll be laying in bed and I, I look over and I see a person moving around my room. And I'm like, who is that? You know? Right. And I can't move. I'm in sleep paralysis and I'm not scared or anything. And then I watch this person, you know, get up out of, get out of me and then walk around the room, come back to me and keeps, they keep doing it a few times. And then eventually like the perspective changes and now I'm that person and I'm getting out of my body and I'm, moving Hmm. around my room and it's like, okay, who am I? You know, like, am I that person? (laughs) And, you know, like, am I that person dreaming that person or what, what is happening? You know? Yeah. Why, why do you draw a line between like out out of body astral and, uh, or why don't you draw a line between out of body astral and lucid dreams? Um, well, because they're incredibly complex. Uh, (laughs) if you, you know, if you read some lucid dream or um, OBE, out-of-body experience uh, type books, and they define um, what an out-of-body experience is, and they may define it in a way that somebody else doesn't really find it, you know. And there's a lot of, uh, if you get into the lucid dream community online or anything like that, there's a lot of debate in the in the definitions of what a lucid dream is or what an out-of-body experience is or astral projection. And they go on and on and they have, you know, all these debates. So I, I kind of just got over the concept of having um, these debates with people about definitions or what they think is like defines these things and said, well, if you're, you know, if you contain any type of lucidity in a dream, then by definition, you're, you're lucid, you know, in an out of body experience or astral projection, you're definitely as lucid as you would be in a lucid dream. Um, at one point I called them like super lucid dreams because they seem they're they seem hyper realistic. And um and so that's kind of where I draw the line is like the percentage of lucidity that you feel when you're having these experiences. But you know there's also debate on like, oh, did you have a true out of body experience? You know, like, yeah. did you see your body while you're laying in bed, or was your body missing when you're when you look down to your bed? Can you see your hands? You know, all this different stuff. Or like, um, if you go travel to somebody, can you see them and and interact with them? You know, or yeah. you know, and then it goes on and on. So rather than just like um, endlessly debate with people about these definitions, I said. Hey, I got an easy solution. You just call it all lucid dreaming, and <laughs> sure. and then you have these varying degrees of lucid experiences that you can have in a dream experience. You know, and we can talk about those, but they're all going to be uh, associated with lucid dreaming, right? Um, I do mention like out of body experiences and astral projection in the book, and I call it by that, but I still consider it a lucid dream in the sense that you're you have awareness. 
Well, I, I would think if, if you could have a re- – so assuming a out-of-body experience is a, uh objective thing, that you're somehow leaving your body, right. um, I would think you could have that without being lucid of it. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's like Robert Bruce and Dr. Monroe and myself. I've had um, like, you know, watching myself in, walk around my room, you know, yeah. that would be um, a case of me – having split awareness where my, you know, energy body, you could call it left my physical body, but my awareness was still in my physical body. And then it shifted throughout the dream experience to the other body, you know, the energy body from the physical body. And then my perception shifted. Um, You know, that's one case of like two different things occurring at the same time, you know, is this provable though? It's, it's up for for debate if that really happened, right? Or if I was dreaming that I tend to think that out of body experiences are real, and I really experienced that. Um, but um, you know, other other people have said the same thing. Like uh, Robert Bruce uh, has talked about seeing other people um, out of their bodies and they don't recall it, and that it happens every single night to every single person, and they do things sometimes and the, and they don't recall. Um, Dr. Monroe says the same thing. And I've had dream experiences where I supposedly go visit people. You know, they, they write me and they're like, hey, I saw you. You know, you're out of your body. You're doing stuff. You're teaching me things. And I was like, I don't recall any of that. Mm-hmm. But the interesting part about it is that they um, explain to me what I'm teaching them. And it's stuff that I've never told them before and that I'm actually currently learning, you know. Right. So, um that's kind of, you know, I, I would say that I was a pretty, um, pretty strong materialist uh, not too long ago. And, you know, the more I dove into these experiences, the more feedback I got from people uh, about these, like, uh, experiences that they're having of me without me having any memory of doing it, you know, and they're so accurate and clear what I'm telling them and teaching them, I'm like, wow, like this is <laughs> it kind of blew me away, you know? Yeah. So I think there's a lot more going on than I can possibly really understand or other people. And, um, you know, I, I personally think that people have out of body experiences all the time without recalling them. They just, they generally just don't remember them or they, um, uh, they can't remember them because their perception split or something like that. And, um, you know, it's, it's just really complex. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, now you said you were a, a materialist. You, you, would you not define yourself that way now? Uh, I mean, I'm still a materialist in the sense that like, I, I, um, live in a physical reality <laughs> <laughs> right right and i i find it very important to do so you know yes um i don't believe in a uh a simulation world or anything like that but i do um i i definitely am open more open to the the concept of like a um a non-material reality um and also that this reality that you and I are experiencing is most likely the result of that versus the other way around. So, um, and that kind of answered a lot of my questions about, uh, lucid dream experiences and other spiritual experiences and, you know, ghosts and all that stuff. Um, kind of, if I turned it around and looked at it as a top down perspective, say like, uh, the spiritual, you know, or fields, creating and manifesting reality out of that, then things kind of started making a lot more sense yeah. um, versus the other way around. So, you know, I think uh, dream experiences and pretty much any altered experiences is kind of, um, they're all very similar in that they um, are made of the same material and that physical reality is actually kind of a manifestation of that. And if you kind of go into that thinking um, you know, then, then dreams and lucid dreams and, um, out of body experiences, national ejection all kind of come together because they're just layers, you know, different, like, um, layers to that experience, you know, they're all one and the same essentially, but they, they're shifting of consciousness, you know, perspective and, and focus that, um, 
kind of creates the experience. Hmm. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Um, and then how would you, how would you even define consciousness? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too. I don't, <laughs> um, I don't know if I have the answer to that one. Yeah. Um, I think consciousness, you know, it obeys the laws of uh, physics, you know, it's what we, we call energy is consciousness and consciousness can't be destroyed or created and that it's always existed in all things and that um, that you can shift perspective, but um, it shifts, it shifts, consciousness is always there in all things. So it's really a shifting of attention to where that consciousness is that changed the experience. Right, so, right. Um, you know, if you're, if you're able to shift your focus and awareness to a different layer of that consciousness, then you would have a different experience. And we do that all the time in our waking lives. You know, we can, we can uh, zone out, you know, and yeah. our awareness is focused on something else. And then we come back to, you know, like driving a car or something like that. Right, right. And, and suddenly we're like, well, I, I don't know how I made it to work, but you know, I'm glad <laughs> I did. Um, but, you know, our, our consciousness was somewhere else, you know, is in our imagination or something, you know, and or in a podcast we're listening to or something like that. So, um, you know, I, in that sense, it's hard to define what consciousness is besides all things, you know, like all things is conscious. So, well, well, yeah. And, uh, what was it? Colin, Will was it Colin Wilson that, that find the, un that sort of part of us as the robot. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, unconscious. Um, yeah, you know, young, young, or however you say, decide to say his name. Um, <laughs> you know, he he uh, he had like the collective unconscious, yeah. personal unconscious stuff like that. Uh, I spent a great deal of time studying Young and his work. Um, I was going to school for that for my uh, PhD uh, uh, in Jungian's uh, depth psychology and trying to really get in there and. Um, you know that there, there is an aspect to that i would agree with young that there is an aspect to humans that is unconscious you know we we don't know about it you know and it's kind of like um a veil surrounding us that we can't really get into this other part of us that exists and uh, collectively too and and i do agree that it exists but i would say that it's not uh unconscious in that the sense that it's not aware of itself and that we're not part of it and that we can't also shift into it. And I think, uh, young and as well as other depth psychologists are very critical of lucid dreaming experiences because, um, cause they like that idea of the unconscious and not meddling with it, not being able to really go into it and explore or anything like that. They, they kind of, um, that's kind of their whole thing, you know? So, um, they want to know the unknowable, you know, in a sense. And what I, th I think is um, more true, you know, is that the unknowable actually uh, is already <laughs> already knows itself very well, and that we're part of it, and that we can experience that by shifting our perspective into it, you know. So um, it is us in that sense. It's not something separate. It's just um, we kind of are choosing to be uh, forget that we're part of that thing by focusing on uh, the material reality, you know, yeah. and through meditation and other techniques, you know, uh, we're able to shift our perspective um, by uh, changing how uh, we perceive reality. Yeah. And I mean, there's plenty of quote unconscious stuff, like, like the fact that our heart beats, you know, that's, that's right. We don't want to, I mean, yeah, there are people who can control their heart, but I would think that, <laughs> I'd be scared to control my heartbeat and the fact that I'd be afraid that I wouldn't be able to get it to go back to the automatic control, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, if you read accounts of, I mean, when I started all of this, you know, um, this maze of craziness that I'm going through today, even is, um, you know, I explored, uh, subjects like shamanism and stuff like that. And, um, you know, there's plenty of accounts of people that, um, have, been able to interact with different body parts on a um on a, almost a personal level you know like speak yeah. to them and stuff like that and and they greatly express the dangers of um 
messing with those things you know like you can you can dive into some aspects of yourself that maybe are damaging you know Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are really hyper focused on destroying uh, the ego and stuff like that. They're like, I want to just, you know, ego this, you know, and stuff like that. And it's like, uh, you know, the ego is part of us. Right. We all have one. And those who don't think they have one probably have more so <laughs> than, than others. Um, but I would be very cautious about destroying any part of our bodies, you know, or who we are because, um, you know, if it's pretty common for all people to have something, then it's uh, it may be damaging for <laughs> you to <laughs> right. remove it, you know, like uh, your heart, you know. So, um, you know, I, I just am cautious about things like that. And also, you know, I, I would say that when I first started experimenting with these subjects, you know, and really diving down into the lucid dream, I was very reckless in my experience, you know, in what I was doing. And I think that's common for most people, you know, like. Uh, when we're young or whatever, we we are a little bit more risky than we are when we're older. And if you ask anybody why they stop being so risky, they're like, "Hey, I, I learned, you know, I learned that that's dangerous behavior and it might hurt me." Right. So the same thing goes with um, you know dreams and stuff like that. It, you can take you to some dangerous waters, I think, if you are very unconscious or uncautious about it, or even unconscious, you could say. And, <laughs> um, and it may cause you some uh, negative effects, you know. And I actually wrote about some of those experiences in my book, you know, um, and kind of warned people against uh, trying to really force things to happen and stuff like that just because of the negatives I've had. Yeah, you, you mentioned the ego thing and the uh, couple of things come to mind. One, like to me, ego is what we use to interact with this reality. Right. Like you can't really be egoless and re- and interact with this reality. It's not a thing. Right. And when you said people who have, you know, who say they have no ego, usually <laughs> the ones who they, the first person that comes to mind is Alistair Crowley. Because <laughs> I re- I respect Crowley's work. I think the guy was brilliant on a number of levels, but man, his ego was as big as anyone's and he'd be like, "I've achieved egoless." It's like, <laughs> "No, now you have it." <laughs> right. I I I have a uh idea that he was trolling a lot of people oh he certainly know. was he certainly was <laughs> he he's been he was known to troll people in his work too you know once yep. they decoded a message or something like that it's like a total joke and uh-huh. he's just making fun of them and it's like all right so <laughs> yep. you know anybody uh, I, I mean to be a troll you know like that you have to have a pretty large ego i think too so <laughs> <laughs> that's also true um but yeah i think you know Ego is important. Uh, it allows us to healthy ego. Re- yes, um, you know, Jung. Jung would say there's many ways of having an ego. There's there's a too strong of an ego, and when you have too strong of an ego, if something can um, shake you up enough to break it, you know, then it shatters into a million pieces, and it's really hard to put back together. Yeah. Um, if you have too malleable of an ego, then anything that you encounter will enter your ego and possess you it will turn you into a robot for somebody else you know like yeah. uh, we've seen those people you know blindly following other spiritual teachers or something like yep. that and it's yep. like yes i believe everything you're saying you know it's like <laughs> wow how, how did you get to that you know and um and and then there's the what we would call like a healthier ego, which is a malleable ego, but it, you know, it, it's firm enough that it can protect the individual, but it's malleable enough that allows for the person to have material enter them, interact with them, and then, you know, be on its way. Um, if you, if you do any research on like uh, default mode network, stuff like that, and that's a common term today for like psychedelic use and meditation and stuff they're like oh this disrupts the default mode network and all this well if you if you dig a little deeper into default mode network and the operation and say like um people with dementia or alzheimer's or anything like that and you start seeing the um correlation to default mode network shutdown and dementia then it's kind of brings into a different perspective of the dangers of not having an ego and because right. um dementia patients you know they 
they are essentially losing their ego. They're losing their sense of self, time, memory, all those things that are associated with ego. And it's not pretty, you know. I don't think anybody would wish that on somebody else. Right, right. um, You know, there's there's a way to be when you're alive, I think. And there's, uh, I, I don't know... Uh, the answer to what the purpose of being alive is and i don't i wouldn't trust really anybody that would tell me that either yeah um but i know it's important and i know that ego is an important part of being alive and when we die we definitely lose ego so (laughs) it will come eventually to all of us so well, and because we don't need the ego once we're dead, and I, and I, I was always fascinated by the ideas of multiple multiple selves, you know, like the the way the Egyptians would break it down into different parts, uh, you know, maybe the ego part, the shell, is what it's what sometimes becomes a ghost, you know, while while the rest of us move on. Yeah, the image that comes to mind is like a a, a beautiful flower, you know, like the flower isn't um, the whole entire thing, you know, that's that's the end part of the plant, you know, that, that blossoms and is beautiful, but there's a lot of ugly things that you could think of, you know, that go on with, um, a flower and making it into a flower or a plant right, turning right. into a flower, you know, like, uh, they're usually in, um, manure and things like yeah, that, you know, yep. getting nutrients and all that and the dirt and all the grime and everything. And it's like, wow, this is, this is kind of, uh, nasty, you know? And, but it turns into this beautiful thing in the end, you know, and I think um, life is kind of like that. It's, you know, we, we, we identify these things as nasty because, well, it, it's harder to interact with people that have ego, you know, and cause yeah. they're always trying to get their own way. And, right. uh, you know, but that's, that's part of the blossoming process. And then eventually, um, you know, when we're ready to pass on, then um, we've fully been developed, you know, hopefully, to the point that we turn into a beautiful flower, you know? Um, so I think, you know, I think there's correlation to that. If you could talk to a plant, I wonder what it would say, you know, it's yeah. like, Oh, I'm at the, I'm not the end of my life now. And you're like, no, this is the most important part. You're like flowering. It's beautiful. And it's <laughs> like, man, I'm done. You know, like there's nothing left to me. And it's like, what? So, you know, it's, I don't, I don't know that for a fact, you know, <laughs> yeah, the materialist yeah, yeah. to me is like, well, are you sure that's what's happening? You know, but um, you know, I I tend to think that that it's is good, kind of it's true. a good metaphor, right? Yeah, there's there's a quote from your book, and I don't remember if you were quoting someone at the time, <laughs> but you said, "Not conscious is is not aware of the unconscious, despite us being driven by it." Yeah, I, that's not me, um, and I'm I can't remember the person that. Um, that said it to be honest with you. Um, but it's like, yeah, the, the, uh, I, I, it's hard for me even to quote that one because it's so, <laughs> it's like why, such a, that's why I wrote it down twister. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's essentially saying like the, the unconscious is not unconscious of itself, you know? Right. And, and it is such a, uh, you know, in our culture, it, it's so bizarre that people use the word unconscious, you know, and then try to, make sense of being conscious of it. And um, (laughs) like today I was reading about unconscious bias, you know, and um, a side story, I did jury duty and they had us watch the video on um, unconscious bias. And I I was sitting there and I had a young book in my hand even, you know, and I was like, I was like, what are they talking about? You know, like being conscious of the unconscious. I'm like, what are they, what is going on here? These people are crazy. You know, it's like, uh, so it's it's just so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let, let, let's get into the lucid dreaming part of stuff yeah. a little bit. Um, what are some of the sensations uh, you, you talk about in the book? Uh, the type of sensations you'll feel when you're entering sort of a lucid state. Um, well, um, it really depends on um, how you go about it. So a lot of people that have lucid dreams, they are suddenly aware that they're dreaming and it's kind of hard to describe like or even pinpoint what does that you know um i had a lucid dream just yesterday and it was it was like that i i just became aware that i was dreaming suddenly there was nothing no sensations no nothing that i could really pinpoint down it was just like oh i'm i'm dreaming you know Mm -hmm. and then i'm awake you know in my dream um but 
in other cases, you can have transitional experiences into a dream state and hold awareness with those or even become aware of those sensations and then pass them on to a lucid dream because you're you're holding on awareness while you're actually transitioning into a dream state and a lot of people you know they call that like sleep paralysis or hypnagogia and stuff like that and um so a sensation of like falling or flying uh, can be associated with having a lucid dream and a lot of people say that flying dreams are actually um you're having an out-of-body experience and that's why you're flying in a dream and yeah, yeah. you just kind of um your brain puts together a story so you you just think that you're flying an airplane or you're doing superman or something like that right and but uh the most um memorable experiences with sleep paralysis because it can be absolutely horrific and t- terrifying for a lot of people and it's very real and um it's almost physical you know it, it is physical in the sense that you uh, sleep paralysis is where you, you become aware that you can't move. There's a, uh, a phase in sleep where it puts your brain, uh, your pawns in your brain actually physically shut down your motor control in your body besides your eyes. And it makes it so you don't act out your dreams. And so for some people, they can become aware when that mechanism takes place and feel the paralysis. So they, they realize they can't move. And, um, during that experience, uh, people can have the split awareness so they can um, see things or hear things or hear themselves even you know, as like two different people. And also, you know, you can have vibrations, um, things like that, where it's, it feels like a intense vibrating, you know, like um, like a train's going by almost like you feel the vibration and it can be very jarring. Um, and but if you learn to like um, accept that experience and can kind of allow it to process, it's one of the best ways to get into a lucid dream experience because you can hold on to your it, essentially when you have these experiences, the sleep paralysis, you're awake and and dreaming at the same time. You're transitioning into a dream state by being awake. Yeah. And if you can hold your awareness through that process, then you can be completely aware that you're dreaming, you know, almost every single time that you go to sleep, if you can do that. I'm not one of those people that can do that. Um, if I practice enough, then it will happen more often. But, um, you know, for some people, I would say they're gifted. You know, they can they can definitely do that. Or with a lot of practice, people can do that. And they can train themselves to do that. So, um, you know, th- those are just some of the sensations that you can have. Um, you know, you can hear... Um, a lot of people hear different things like um, bees or chimes or slamming doors and things like that. Uh-huh. Uh, those can oftentimes they jar you awake, you know, but uh, they're considered like tests to make sure you're asleep too by the mm. brain. The brain's trying its best to make sure that you're actually asleep so that you're, um, you're not going to act out your dreams and meddle with things while you're asleep. So it does its best to try to make sure that you're, you're sleeping. And so those are just some of the sensations. Now, there's we've done a number of shows on sleep paralysis um, because it seems like, yes, yeah, sleep paralysis has a fairly, you know, common sense explanation. But we've also <laughs> wondered, being an altered state, if people are sometimes actually dealing with an other. Um, right. Also, the fact that it seems like there are certain cases where sleep paralysis has been catching. Like someone yeah. will not have sleep paralysis, will sleep with someone you know, because they're in a relationship or whatever. And then they start having sleep paralysis because the other person does. Yes. Yeah. You're, uh, you're tapping into one of my favorite subjects of all time, which is sleep paralysis. (laughs) If you ever (laughs) already noticed. Um, I mean, I, I had sleep paralysis, um, my first time, uh, 2006 and I had been lucid dreaming all my life up to that point. And that's after my first, uh, or series of sleep paralysis experiences is when I had, my first out of body experience Mm -hmm. and things really changed then. Um, my first experience was like a physical attack for months, almost nightly if I slept in one room and, Hmm. um, it only ended when I finally, um, ate the thing that was attacking me. (laughs) I noticed you do that a few times. 
Yeah, and uh, oddly enough, I found other people doing the same thing. One, um, one of my regular co-hosts, Ren Collier, uh, had an experience, and he ended up eating the thing as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's that's interesting. Um, I'm not surprised at that at all either. Um, it's such a even weird. Like, it's a weird response. It is. It's very weird. I've eaten two people now in my um, <laughs> in my dreams, and and they're both were in sleep paralysis. It's, it's like a. <laughs> It's almost like an automatic response. It's not something I even thought about doing. It's just something I just did, you know, right. and like an instinct. And there's a tribe, there's like African um, uh, groups that also uh, have been known by like in their indigenous cultures where they eat spirits. So um, in South America, shamans uh, also eat spirits and they put it in their bellies uh, in a material they call phlegm. And they use these spirits as what they call darts to attack or defend themselves from other pe- other shamans and spirits and stuff like that. So there's definitely like a huh. cross cultural link between eating spirits and storing them in your stomach, stuff like that. But um, you know the, the sleep paralysis stuff. Go back to that. Um, the there's a friend of mine. Um, his name's Ryan Hurd. He he wrote books on sleep paralysis, and I've talked to him quite a bit about the subject and um you know he has people that he's talked to where um whole like towns of people like a whole town of people um experiencing sleep paralysis um so commonly that the police officers every year brief their uh troops troopers to um kind of understand that this is going to happen so that when people call them in the middle of night and say hey i had an intruder you know that don't be surprised if there's nobody in the house. <laughs> right. And they wrote Ryan to <clears throat> try to get some sense of this. And he ended up uh, not being able to really help them at the time. Um, but then there's like the new Finland. Uh, uh, they also have hagging, which is like a cultural tradition where they can essentially curse somebody to have the old hag um, oh. come and visit them and then cause them to have sleep paralysis. Um, one experience I had where a group was having sleep paralysis was while I was in the Navy. Um, I was actually, we were on deployment and some of my sailors I was in charge of, they came and they were talking about like, you know, this nightmare and people screaming and stuff, you know, and I was, I was kind of semi paying attention to them. And then I was like, okay, you know, so what's going on here? Cause they were really excited about it, you know? And so I listened in and, and essentially what happened is, um, one person, um, and they're they sleep together in what's called a birthing. It's like a uh, eighty people sleeping in one room, oh, wow. and one person starts screaming, and they're like, "Let me out! Let me out!" You know, and just banging on the walls and stuff. And this other person across from them um, started having sleep paralysis, and and then like another person next to them started having it too, and uh, the guy that was having a nightmare, he was having. Um, a dream that he was like um, dying in his, he was suffocating in his, in his, uh, his bed, which they call it a rack. And so he's, he's having his nightmare. And I, I talked to him later, you know, he was alive and he's fine. And, um, you know, he told me about this nightmare and stuff and the other people were like, yeah, you know, I could see him screaming, but I couldn't move. Yeah. So I was having sleep paralysis. They didn't know what it was called, you know? Right. And, and I was like, this is crazy. And, um, they did some research and they found out that somebody died in that same bed and they, they, the person died suffocated. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting, um, link, you know, it came, yeah. kind of gave me the chills when I heard that. I was like, well, yeah, may, may, maybe they picked up that information subconsciously and then they were, you know, it was coming through in the, in that, in that dream state. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, huh. sleep paralysis is so, Weird. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody thinks, you know, like they can just explain away sleep paralysis, there's a group online on Facebook. Um, it's called sleep paralysis and it has, uh, it has like 21,000 people in there. I'm one of the moderators for it. And some of these people, you know, they're, they're totally cross cultural, um, from all over the world. Some of them don't even speak English, you know, and they're all just not all of them, but a great majority of them are describing seeing the same things, you know, hearing the same things, having, 
you know, the same experiences, like almost word by word, you know, it's like, yeah. all right, you know, either this is so ingrained in our biology that we all have the same horrible nightmares, you know, and we see all the same dead people or whatever, you know, or yeah, yeah. something else is going on. <laughs> so. yeah. I, I, Louis Proud wrote a book, I think his first book was on sleep paralysis, and he said when he wrote the book, he felt that like 60 to 70% were supernatural of some right. sorts and but he's like now now you know a couple books later he's like i think it's more like 30 to 40 <laughs> yeah. percent and, and i'm like that that seems accurate i mean it does seem like something that that would have a, a fairly natural explanation but then you get those oddities like i said i mean i've had i've had plenty of sleep paralysis uh the last time it happened to me actually ended up being sort of funny because uh, I had had a dream that I was going through my mom's old stuff after she died, and I was thinking to myself, wow, it would be great if, like, my dad had hid, like, $10,000 in cash somewhere in the house. <laughs> you know, and this is in the dream. And then, like, something, fly like, one of her stuffed animals flies across the room. I'm like, oh, well, that was cool. And I pull out my, ca my phone, and I'm like, go and do that again. And then, like, a big stuffed animal comes to life and starts, like, attacking me. As I'm, or maybe I didn't have, or maybe I didn't have my phone, and I'm like, why don't I have my phone, or something like that? But I was laughing in the dream, like I had a poltergeist attacking me with a stuffed animal, and I'm, I'm cracking up because it's not scary to me, you know? Right. And I wake up, and then I'm starting to go back to sleep, and as soon as I roll over to go back to sleep, I feel something drop down on the bed behind me, like I haven't even uh. like started to go back to sleep. I've just rolled over. And I just feel the weight on the bed, and then I feel something lean over me. I'm like, oh, great. I'm in sleep yep. paralysis. I can't move. Oh, uh, gosh. And there's yep. this clicking, almost like an insect would make. Mm. And it just feels really oppressive, and I stop and go, hey, did my dad leave $10,000 in the cash somewhere in the house? <laughs> nice. And the thing just went dead quiet for about three or four seconds, and then went, no. <laughs> And I, and I just and I at that point I was able to go there. What good are you? And rolled over and it stopped. And I'm like, oh well, huh? That was different. Yeah, that's so, an interesting one. So the answer I think is to is to throw something at them that they're not expecting. Yeah, yeah. It, sleep process is um, oftentimes you know like when I'm in the midst of it, I'm not as. Um, I don't have my stuff together as much as you did. I'm usually pretty terrified, you know. Yeah. Like, I'm like, oh no, this is like, this is not what I wanted. <laughs> you well, know. And this, and, this, and you, you know, the, uh, thing, the thing is, people will ask me, you know, like I've had all these weird conscious experiences, and people are like, don't they scare you? And I said, no. The only th time I'm ever frightened is during sleep paralysis. Yeah. Some. I mean, there's a biological reason for that. Um, during that period of time where your brain is essentially going to sleep for whatever reason, the amygdala um, becomes super activated and um, it's generally thought of as the seat of fear. So it could be completely irrational fear, you know, that you'll experience in sleep paralysis, but it could be just as terrifying as anything else. Right. Um, my, my nickname that I use online and stuff like that a lot is a uh, Panda dream. And the reason of that is that when I was uh, um, having a sleep paralysis experience, I looked over and there was a giant panda in my room and it was just eating bamboo. And for whatever, you know, like an illogical reason I can think of, you know, a rational reason, I just terrified this thing, just absolutely like trying to scream as loud as I could. And and it didn't move, it didn't react, it didn't do anything, it just kept eating bamboo. And finally, you know, I kind of calmed down from being terrified of it, you know, after a few seconds or something like that. And I was like, why am I why am I even scared of this thing? You know, like it's not doing anything to me. But, you know, recalling that, I'm just like, yeah, sometimes the just the fear alone is like hard to grasp, you know, it's hard to overcome that. So you did a really good thing by kind of just uh not reacting to that experience you know you, i mean a after a while of having these experiences you do start kind of building up a, a sense for that feeling and yeah. i'm sure that you yeah. kind of you know what i'm talking about yes. and 
you can kind of sense it coming on and you're like, oh, okay, here we go again. You know, like just leave me alone. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, especially when you're really tired and it keeps happening. Yeah. You're like, stop it. I just want to sleep. You're like, could you just go away for now? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've definitely had those. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better with it now um, that I've had it for, you know, quite a few years. And I just kind of, when I feel coming on, I'm like, okay, but every once in a while, you know, it still gets me where I'm like, ah, I wasn't expecting that one. And yeah, on yeah. The, uh, to be honest with you, like I wake up out of those experiences and I, I feel so energized, you know, like the, the amount of fear and like just terror that you feel in that situation. It's like, it's like, wow, like that was like the best movie I've ever experienced, you know, like <laughs> horror movie. It's like, you can't top that. So, yes, yes. Um, but I, you know, um, sleep paralysis isn't um, something that happens all the time. I, th- I would think it uh, it would be it would be um, it's not uh, I'm trying to find the right words for this. Um, I'd say if I didn't tell people about sleep paralysis that are interested in lucid dreaming, I'd be doing them a dis- disservice, you know, because yes. they yeah. wouldn't be prepared to have that experience when it happens. Um, but I think it's also a necessary aspect of consciousness to experience that thing because it's in a way it's challenging you to deal with the fear, to deal with what the essence of fear is and to try to learn about that. So, you know, if, if somebody's having uh, sleep paralysis and the fear driven experience of that, um, you know, it, it's important not to try to resist that. I think as, as much as possible and really try to, understand it and try to like um work with that so that it's no longer bothers them you know yes um yeah because when i had my first thought of our experience to tell you it was very terrifying before that for me I'm not saying that everybody's is like that you know um but fear at that time in my life was something that i, I needed to work through and even though it wasn't fun you know to do that and it was seemingly out of my control in retrospect, it was one of the best things I could have done for myself, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, it played into a lot of things later in life that, um, could have been terrifying for me, but really I can always look back to that, um, that fear I felt before and say, okay, you know, like I worked with that before. I know, I know what fear is and I'm okay with it, you know, at least up to a point. So I had, a. Uh a very, and I don't know if I've ever mentioned this one on the show. I had a weird lucid sleep paralysis sort of situation where I had woken up and I knew I was asleep. Uh, so I was sort of paralyzed, but I was still sort of in a dream state. Um, and it felt like I was trying to swim up to wake up, like I was trying to wake mm-hmm. up. And at some point, I finally sort of broke the surface. It was like breaking the surface of being uh, almost drowning, you know? Mm-hmm. And I break the surface. I wake up. I'm actually awake. And it literally felt like something came up from behind me, grabbed me, and pulled me back into the deep deep sleep state. Wow. And I've had one other person describe that to me. And I was kind of like, wow, okay, I thought I was the only one who had that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, I've never had that one. But I have had false awakenings where um, uh, I, and it, I mean, you're kind of describing a false awakening in the sense that you thought you were awake, but you're still uh, in sleep paralysis. You know, you're still dreaming, but seemingly pulling yourself out of that. Well, Um, in in this case, I actually woke up. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't had, I haven't had anything like that. I, um, I I have had the false awakening thing. I had I had it. Re- I've had it repeat numerous times where it gets really frustrating because you right. think, oh, I'm awake, and then like you look at the clock. Like, like in my case, I was looking at the clock, and the clock wouldn't have numbers, just like symbols on it. Right. And, yeah. and I'd be like, damn it, I'm still asleep. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I've had. I'll describe two different types of things. Um, one that it wasn't scary or anything. Uh, I was having. I was having a nightmare and I, um, I opened my eyes in waking life and I looked at, um, my wall that I was sleeping next to and I looked at the wall and I looked around my room and then I closed my eyes and went back into my bed or into sleep. And I explained to the dream characters that I forgot my eyes. And so I, 
I was like, I forgot my eyes. And they're like, okay, you know, but I had no, uh, you know, I had no control over like opening my eyes again or anything like that. It was just like, I was like, whoa, that was weird. You know, like I broke out of sleep instantly, looked around and then closed my eyes and I was immediately back in a dream, you know? Wow. Um, and I've, the false awakening ones, I've had them where I've had so many false awakenings that I was absolutely confident that I, I died in my sleep. I was like, okay, oh, wow. I'm, I'm dead. And <laughs> like, I hadn't thought about I'm, that. Yeah. And I was sitting there like, okay, I wonder how I died, you know? And I was like, I probably, <laughs> I must've suffocated from like snoring or something, you know, like sleep apnea. Right. Right. And I was like, oh, well, I guess, I guess this is it, you know? And and then I woke up, you know, um, so it, um, I've not had one where it pulls me back into, um, sleep like that. And not, that's not only happened once. Like that. Yeah. That'd be, uh, that'd be terrifying in its own way. You know, <laughs> it was, no, it totally was because I felt like I was stuck. I mean, cause you know, sleep paralysis is bad enough when you can't shake it, Yeah. but you know, to get out and then have something physically pull, it felt like a, something literally like just came up out of the dream state behind me and sucked me back in underwater yeah i mean people would describe that as being your your other self you know and it's yeah it's like no you're not done yet you know <laughs> you you still have something to learn here <laughs> so we're gonna shut you down and and again um, it's, it's it's always hard to say like is this are these all other parts of ourself or are we occasionally dealing with others right or other things other spirits other people whatever Right. Yeah. And sleep paralysis definitely encountered things that seemed outside myself, you know, yeah. and very illogical. You know, I can't rationalize those things as like anything that I would ever think about or why I would have those things. Um, a lot of dead people, you know, mm. I've seen a lot of people that seem very dead and um, not necessarily mean or anything, you know, um, you seen aliens. You relate Is a couple of zombie dreams in the book. Yeah, zombies are active, um, you know, and they could be, cons you know, misunderstood as like uh, dead people as well, or um, very symbolic, you know, of yeah. a copy of myself being dead, things like that. And in the book, I kind of talk about how I uh, worked with those things in order to like um, become whole kind of with it. Yeah, and I was fascinated uh, by that. Yeah, it was, I mean, it wasn't anything that I really comp contemplated prior to that you know and even in in the book i talk about um a teacher kind of helping me out you know um with that uh i'll leave i'll leave the readers to read that one but um yeah or the listeners to read that one but um the um you know and uh aliens too i've definitely had quite a few alien encounters and sleep paralysis um and also like um other beings you know like a gnome i saw a gnome once which was you know i'm not in interested in gnomes whatsoever i never really even imagined seeing a gnome in any of my dreams right and um definitely saw you know a small person <laughs> running around <laughs> um interacting with me uh it was absolutely terrifying you know <laughs> and uh um and odd uh animals you know that are don't that don't seem as nice either you know they're very parasitic kind of um beings of some kind and huh. very you know very clear and detailed stuff that you would see in like uh horror movies you know that uh, don't exist in reality and stuff like that so right. um you know it's 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 uh i'd imagine that it's it's just like any other um you know nature reserve or whatever you want to call it there's just weird things in there and you can encounter them and they're real in the sense that they're um they can affect you on your psyche you know they can affect that very very really very real <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know and physical um you know there's plenty of cases of people being physically um uh, changed based on some sleep paralysis experiences and stuff like that. So yeah, I can't really throw those out, you know, throw those out. Um, I've never had that happen to me uh, myself, but you know, I, I take everything with a grain of salt, but I also leave uh, it open, you know, yeah. in the sense that just because I haven't had experienced something doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. Sure. And, um, you know, a lot of people I think do that. They, they go, Oh, it's, you know, this is impossible. It's not real. 
and, until you have the experience, you know, and then it changes you. And people would say the same thing. I've had people say the same thing about lucid dreams. They're like, no, oh, that, that there's no such thing as a lucid dream. You know, it's like, okay. Yeah. You know, like what, <laughs> you know, like how can you even say that just because you haven't experienced it doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't exist. You know, what about all these other people? So, um, you know, I, uh, I'm not really in uh, business to, to debate with those people, you know, and, uh, my business is dealing with my own personal experiences and how I can relate to that and grow from that and become a better person. You know, yes. it's not about um, disproving or proving somebody else's experiences right or wrong right. or whatever. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I take uh, my mantra of life is now. Uh, I would say I used to be in that business of trying to disprove stuff, you know, and that was when I was hyper uh, materialist, you know. Right, right, and, right. And now well, I'm. I learned my lessons. How about I'd say that, you know, <laughs> I, t- I tend to look at all of this stuff. Like, you know, when people say, Oh, we, you know, we need proof of UFOs. We need proof of Bigfoot. <laughs> I, I, I would say w- there's no real doubt that people are experiencing something. Right. You know, we know this stuff goes back through all of our historical records in every culture, you know, weird lights yeah. in the sky, weird, re- weird creatures in the woods, you know, whatever it is. All of it has, you know, so the interpretations may not be right. Right. You know, yeah. but the experiences are real. So when we're saying we need to prove they're real, I don't think we need to prove they're real. I think the fact that, that we have seen this stuff throughout history suggests that something is happening. It's just a matter of what. Right. Yeah. I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that in trying to prove something is real and in, the context of the things that we're talking about is kind of going about it the wrong way. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, prove to me that reality is real. Right. You know? Exactly. And it's like, um, well, we have our senses, you know, like we interact with each other and it's like, that doesn't mean that it's the, the real that you're talking about, you know? Yeah. Like the real that the, the extreme materialists are talking about is an impossibility. It's, yes. it's not possible. So nothing by their definition is actually real, you know, it's, right. uh, it's flawed. So, um, you know, in that sense, you know, anybody that knows anything about psychology, um, could evaporate their, their debate on realness, you know, pretty quickly. <laughs> right. And, and that's used in anybody in physics, you know, or math or anything like that could eventually come to the same point where they're like, um, you know, what you're, what you're looking for is not going to be there, you know, <laughs> right? Uh, in anything that you study. So um, it's like the 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 expert of any subject eventually comes to the conclusion they know very little about what they, <laughs> you know, what they think they know. Right. So I think that it all circle it all circles around and comes back to itself. Um, do you, would you like me to talk about some of the techniques for lucid dreaming for your listeners? Yes, so they, um, but okay. I, I also wanted to, before you get to that, talk about yeah. how people can remember their dreams. I know a lot of people, for some reason, uh, will tell me, <laughs> well, I don't dream. And it's like, yes, you do. You just don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you're absolutely right. Um, people do dream, you know, and they generally just don't recall their dreams. And that's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually... For the most part, people that don't recall their dreams are healthy individuals. Um, if you recall your dreams all the time, they're, I would consider you as abnormal because that's not normal for people to do that. Um, and it also may be evidence of some type of sleep disorder of some kind. So, um, hmm. you know, remembering your dreams every single night in full detail all the time is probably not um, something you would want to encourage a person to do. Um, but you know, dreams definitely have, uh, an aspect of them that is trying to convey a message, teach us something and are really important to recall, you know, when they are recalled and somebody that doesn't remember their dreams and would like to, I would encourage them to try to do techniques and stuff that, so they could recall it because they have a desire to do that. You know, um, I definitely would push somebody into trying to recall their dreams that's kind of what i'm getting at um right right. so you want to be safe and healthy about anything that uh, i talk about um but one of the you know 
the the best ways to recall your dreams is to try to increase lucidity in your dreams. So, okay, <laughs> of course, right? Because then you're aware and you can recall. Right, um, right, right. But but different uh, things that people can do, you know, to really try to just recall is to start like dream journaling. Yeah, and and the reason. You know, there's a lot of debate to why dream journaling works, but it absolutely does work uh, for very majority of people. And the, um, you know, simply having a, a journal next to your bed and writing it down or or writing it on your phone is very accept- susceptible or acceptable for improving dream recall. And the more you do that, the more that you'll recall your dreams. Um, the reasons that I think that this works is because. Not only is it refreshing your memory in the morning because dreams, as anybody know, um, can fade pretty quickly. And so I may remember I had a dream in the morning, but then um, as the day goes on, I, I quickly forget about it and I can't recall anything. Just like, you know, what I ate yesterday is, you know, it's a blur as well. So, but if I wrote it down, I definitely would recall it and uh, jog my memory of the whole eating experience, you know. So, mm-hmm. The same it goes for a dream. So if you can at least write down a little bit about it, you know, quickly before you forget about it, um, you may later on the day read that note that you made and it may jog your memory. And then suddenly you have the whole entire experience that you may have forgotten um, about. Um, And a dream journal is great for like historical dreaming, too. So I have many journals that I've kept over the years. And sometimes I go back and I go, wow, like I totally forgot I had this dream. And it was like. Uh huh. At the time, profound and life changing. You know, right. now I'm like, I just don't remember it. And so, um, those are always, you know, really cool experiences. Um, but dream journaling, another thing that I think that dream journaling does is it, it realigns your focus and attention to what you're trying to get, you know, and it's kind of giving your, you could call it unconscious or subconscious or whatever you want to call it, um, the, uh, a shift in focus for you. You know, it says, hey, um, Lee, you know, m- myself is interested in recalling their dreams. So I will give Lee more memory of those dreams, you know, or even more intense dreams or convey a message in a way that Lee can get in the dream, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of making a space for your dream to express itself or for your or unconscious or subconscious to express itself through dream imagery and it may reunite ignite your your uh, nightly dreams so those are really um dream journaling you know is a really profound way uh another thing that dream journaling does is it kind of creates a ritual of um the dream experience and in modern days and times, we don't really do rituals or we don't think of rituals as anything that we do, but we definitely have a daily ritual that we do. And it kind of refocuses our mind on the things that we find are important, you know, like eating breakfast at this time and things like that throughout the day, you know, is a ritual and it makes us, makes our mind say this is important. So if we have a daily ritual of um, writing, taking the time and energy and writing in a dream journal or our mind is going to say this is important to me and I'm going to put the energy and the focus into it and really um, I'm going to get something out of it. Yeah, I think with dreams, the more work you put in, the more you get out. So um, those are definitely uh, – dream journaling is a great technique. Um, another thing is you know getting the, getting the right amount of sleep and also um, some of the techniques in lucid dreaming have to do with like what times you wake up, what times you go to bed, things that you eat, you know, things you drink before you go to bed, exercising, things like that. So um, in my book, you know, uh, one chapter is, is is really focused on um, good sleep hygiene because mm-hmm. it's important for anybody, including and especially lucid dreamers, to get good quality sleep as well when they're not, you know, practicing a lucid dream technique or something like that. So getting good nights amounts of sleep will also improve your ability to recall dreams, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and the longer that you sleep also will improve the amount of memories that you have from dreams because uh, the longer that you stay asleep, um, essentially you have more REM and REM, uh, random eye movement is generally associated with having a dream. Um, there also are non-REM dreams, but they're not as common as REM dreams um, based on evidence. So, 
um, people that practice lucid dreaming or dream recall generally try to stay asleep longer periods of time in the morning because then um, you have more dream recall. Um, so there's just some, I'd say, easier ways of improving dream recall, but there's other like supplements and stuff like that that can um, change how you uh, how you recall your dreams as well. Right, right. You get go in a pretty extensive list of things in the, in the book. Yeah, um, you know, there some are more controversial than others, um, and um, some are damaging to dream recall and stuff like that too but can be used as tools if used properly um and you know one common thing that people do um which i would say is very um healthy you know is is drinking um and you know alcohol is definitely can cause an increase in dream recall um because of how it interacts with the brain when you're intoxicated and then when you can become sober it allows for the brain to essentially uh, have sleep re- or REM rebound and it increases the drains um, when you become sober. So if you had a heavy night of drinking and you woke up the next day and you're like, wow, like my dreams are really intense and I had a lot of them. It's because when you're intoxicated, it suppressed your, your ability to actually dream. And then once you start sobering up that rebound effect, which is like um, essentially the, the brain, will get what it, it desires in sleep with interest. So it's like a bank and mm. it's going to loan you, it's going to loan you awareness, you know, for a period of time, but it's going to get its money back, you know, in REM with interest. So you'll get actually more REM than you bargained for. So, um, you know, that's kind of a quick explanation of why people have lots of dreams when they uh, sober up, you know, the next day or whatever. Gotcha. Um, one of the things you don't touch on in the book, what, what about things like prophetic dreams? Um, well, there's a good book actually coming out on that subject from Inner Traditions. And uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, his, it was Eric, Eric Wargo, I think. Oh, Eric, yeah, I've had Eric on before. He's uh, yeah. He wrote an excellent book called Time Loops. Yeah, so his second book is actually on prophetic lucid dreams. That makes and sense. And prophetic dreams. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, he, he's a interesting guy and I had like a interesting synchronicity with him, um, where he wrote an article on alchemy and out of body experiences. And I really, it really, I really enjoyed it and it, it opens me up to other topics. And, um, and then later on, uh, with my book, inner traditions asked me to review his book for him. So I was able to mm. read it beforehand and stuff. And, he also did the same thing with my book. So it was kind of cool. Um, but he kind of, uh, I never really thought that I never really thought that prophetic dreams occurred at the level that he talks about. Um, but, uh, he kind of opened me up to the idea of prophetic dreams, um, uh, more so than I had before. I never really thought of them being a important aspect of my life for some reason. Um, I did have a semi prophet or pro, prophetic dream sorry um and i had a dream it wasn't lucid or anything like that where um my sister's boyfriend at the time he went skydiving and he died and i came home and in the in the dream experience it was just essentially me coming home and my sister telling me um that she was really upset because her boyfriend died and everybody was really upset and so i woke up and i i was like you know i just felt inside myself that i had to tell my sister you know that this very intense dream. And mm-hmm. I was like, Hey, you know, um, I had this dream and all this stuff happened. And she said to me that, um, she was so thankful that I told her because that day he was going to go skydiving and she never mentioned this to me at all. And so she told him, you know, about my dream and mm-hmm. he ended up not going, uh, skydiving because of it. Cool. And so who, you know, who knows, uh, if he would have died or not, or even if that's an option, you know, right, but right, right. <laughs> for whatever reason, I knew that, you know, somehow that he was going to go skydiving and, um, that in my dream, it wasn't going to end well. So that's probably as close as I've had to, um, those type of dreams. I've mm-hmm. had people tell me from those dreams that I've mentioned before, where they, I teach them things. Um, and they seem to express that those are, um, 
future events that I'm actually going back in time somehow and teaching them these things. And right. So I'm just kind of, I don't know what to say about that, you know? It's yeah, kinda, well, you know, what is time? That's the thing. Right. Just like yeah, what I, is reality? Yeah. If you read his time loop books, you know, and then you're like, okay, I, I don't know what time is anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> his, his, um, his time loop book helped me formulate a mechanism from which some of this stuff works. Right. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, his book, his, I don't necessarily agree with him on the block universe thing, but uh, okay. he, he makes some really interesting points in that book. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, you make a great point about his book as well as my, I, I had hoped that people would do the same thing for me is that if they, if they find a disagreement with what I have to say, which is perfectly fine because I can't read my book anymore and say I agree with everything I had to say. It sure. takes a long time for a book to get published, you know. Yeah. So by that time, um, many of my theories about, you know, I try to leave a lot of theories out of my book just because of that. I said, well, maybe in the, you know, in five years from now, this book is meaningless to me, you know, if I did that. So um, a lot of the things, uh, ideas that I've had in the past, you know, have changed and turned into other things. So, um, you know, it, it's important to, I think, to do that. Uh, take take what is positive out of it and say, well, maybe there's something here I don't agree with yet, you know, or so maybe the author doesn't, you know. Yeah. And and people are more than welcome to email me or contact me and, uh, you know, they're like, well, what did you think? Did you think about this or whatever, you know, or, um, you know, I'm glad to talk to them and figure out what they think, you know. Cause right, right. I, I don't have all the answers. That's one thing I, <laughs> I've realized through all this stuff is that I just, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can just kind of experiment with it. Right. I think, I mean, I think these experiences are to teach us um, uh, not only uh, what it's like to kind of step on the other side, you know, to look through the veil, um, but it's also to teach us about, the the waking world and how it operates, you know, and how yeah. subjective reality can be between each individual, and how mm -hmm. you know it's amazing that we get along already on the level we do with all this, all these differences occurring in just waking reality, you know, um, what, compassion, what, you know, for other people. And one of the things I've I've repeated, you know, to death is that nobody has the same life experience. Like right. everyone's view of reality and, and everything, it's, it's going to be different, even twins, because you're not having the same experiences. Like everyone, right. everyone's view of what reality is, is different. Yeah. I mean, you could say, um, describe to me what, um, what it, what a strawberry tastes like, you know? Yeah. And you would have to describe it by other things that I've had, you know, yeah. you can't describe it by itself. It's not a universal thing, you know, that right. you can just be like, well, right. strawberry tastes like, you know, something that's universal because nothing's universal. The, stra so. the strawberry tastes like number one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, a, yeah, like a number one. Oh, okay. You know, sweet. Um, the pear but, is six. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just not how we do things in, in our reality. So, you know, in, in my whole thing is, okay, so, um, you know, these these fine subjective things can become really big things if you kind of amplify them, you know, like uh, these small changes from person to person really can make tremendously large changes in reality mm -hmm. um, that we all kind of just take for granted as being the same, you know, but um, we could be living very different lives, you know, we most likely are because of that, you know, yes. and we somehow hallucinate together enough that we can actually have a conversation, yeah. you know, not hate each other. <laughs> we, we have agreed upon reality. Yeah. I'd say it's agreed upon hallucination of reality, yes. you know, yes. too. Yeah, it's yeah, not absolutely. Even, it's not even remotely close. It's a hallucination. <laughs> you, sure so, it's, you sure it's not just a simulation? <laughs> well, um, that's another di discussion, I'd say, but um, <laughs> I don't believe in a simulation. Let's just say that. All right. I believe I believe in a result from things. But oh, I see. What a, you, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a simulation describing something as a simulation is um, like a. You're saying a, it doesn't have any meaning. It's symbolic, you know. Yeah. Like you're saying 
if you use a simulation as a symbol, you know, as, as a symbolic uh, understanding of how things operate, then yeah, that's that's good. But if you're a materialist and you're like everything's a simulation, then I'm sorry, I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> leave the conversation there. <laughs> I, I I always liked holographic theory. Um, yeah, hologram. Yeah, I do like the, the simulation theory in the way that Jim Elvich portrays it, um, with with consciousness being similar to the way things work digitally versus right. like analog because he makes some really good points there. Um, but I do think this world matters that, that, right. that is something that I, I do think our lives matter. I think the world matters. We may only be a blip in it, but there's a reason we're a blip in it. Yeah. Um, I think it's Bohm's. I can never say his right. His name. Oh yeah. Right, Bohm's. Yeah. Yeah. His holographic universe, uh, theory, I think is very, it matches very accurately to my personal experiences and those things I've read about other people's experiences. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of the occult views of how reality is manifested through like, um, you know, different layers and different yep. fields essentially interacting with each other. I think that's, uh, pretty synonymous with his theory. Yes. And, um, and I think, uh, computers and technology and stuff like that, I think they're, um, very symbolic in, um, representing how those systems work because, a computer works because it works, you know, yeah. it operates off of the, the physical reality and these other realities that we uh, are interacting with and we're part of. So they, they absolutely work because they work. Um, and in that sense, they contain elements of how things work. Yes. So I, I tend to think of like, um, you know, if I wrote a comic book about your life, you know, and, um, and I gave somebody the comic book, um, and they said, "Oh, this is this is the life of that guy, you know. Like this is his life. Uh, you'd be very upset about that. You'd be like, <laughs> you'd be like, no, that the comic book isn't me, you know. Yeah, it contains elements of me, but it's you know, it's not real. And um, I think computers and people describing reality using technology is essentially doing the same thing. Absolutely, it's mistaking a symbol and how they operate with the actual complexity of." how things really are, you know, <laughs> like they're beyond imagination, you know? Yeah. So. Well, we're just about out of time um, before we end up in a whole discussion about AIs and stuff. <laughs> um, where can people, so the book is comes out when? Yeah. The book will come out on May 4th um, this year. So um, they can pre-order it off my website at tailleaders.com or they can type spell, in. Smell that. Um, I'll just, t I'll t tell them the other one. It's lucid dreaming book.com. Okay. Um, let me make sure that's right. Cause it's been a bit. <laughs> yes. I know how that goes. You give out a website and a moment later, you're like, that's right. Right. Is that yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> that's not it. So, um, <laughs> if they type in lucid dream book, so no okay. dreaming it's just lucid dream book.com. It'll take them to the, the page on my website. And, they can order it on Amazon. They can get a signed copy through my website, nice. uh, as well as some other stuff that will come with it. Or they can go to Inner Traditions and buy it through there. Okay. All and, right. uh, do you mind if I spend a few minutes just talking about some techniques for them? Because uh, I want to make sure not to leave people with um, without some goodies on uh, well, maybe having their first dream you, experience. You, if you can do it in about three minutes. Oh, um, no, we'll leave it to a different time then. All right. <laughs> Um, or they can get my book, you know. And where where are the forums? Yes, pe people should get your book. Your book is a very good read. Um, yeah. Where where, can, where what about the forums and stuff you were talking about? Where can people find um, those? So they uh, if they click on if they go to my website and type in or click on discussion. Um, there's many different ways that they can either talk with people. They can do um, uh, a forum there, or they can do a Discord. They can join a live chat. Um, and there's Facebook groups and stuff like that. So they can, there's probably four different ways to communicate with me and other people through there. Okay. Um, and they can also email me directly. Um, that works too. They can find the contact on the website. Um, but also, you know, for those people that want to buy my book or whatever, there's free guides on my website um, under the blog. They can type it, they can click on free guides and there's loose dreaming guides and a bunch of different guides in there for free. And it's, kind of the same stuff that's in my book, just not as well edited and like described and stuff. So they can go there. And I also have videos 
on each section too so they can watch the video and me talking about it as well if they care to do that okay all right um do you have some time to stick around and do a patreon segment yeah sure okay so thank you for joining me for this main part no problem and again i highly recommend the book it's called what um <laughs> uh it's hard to remember because i changed the <laughs> yeah i know uh, a visionary guide to lucid dreaming Okay, um, and you methods are methods for working with the dream, deep dream state. Okay, and you are Lee Adams. Yes. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Lee. No problem. It's great to be on. I want to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons. It's because of you this show is able to exist, and I want to give a special shout out to those pledging ten dollars or more. Super Inframan, Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, Tim, Jim, and Sophie, Beverly Williamson. MTK, Nagatha Christie, Patricia W, Frank Earl, Barbara Fisher, Will Powell, Big Boy Limina, Craig Parmenter, Walker, Joanna Rojas, Maddie, David Moore, Vincent Trewell, Stone Wilderness, Luke Osborne, Becky Trainer, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Edu Camelhort, Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Taylor, Sam Sharon, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, Mark Bowley, Denise Sarek, Chris Ernst, Andy McNamara, Sedger, Riker and Stark, J. Otto Bullet, Jose A., Charles Davis, Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Linz Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Ad Noctum, Stefan D., Carl Mahoney, and James Lattimore. Thank you all so very much. All right. If you enjoyed that, there is a Patreon segment with Lee that's, I think, possibly longer than this show was. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about with him, and he'll definitely be back. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredtheroadgo.com and click on the link for Patreon. It's only $3 a month. You get extra stuff pretty much every week, plus early access to the shows and the occasional giveaway. Also, check out our website for uh, merch. There's a merch link there for uh, shirts and all kinds of other stuff with uh, four different designs, two from Timothy Renner, two from Jeff Ritzman. See you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>